Welcome to this service of worship sponsored by the Princeton University Chapel for the weekend of May 24th, 2020. My name is Allison Bowden and I serve as Dean of Religious Life and of the Chapel at Princeton. This is Memorial Day weekend and I hope that means that you are able to be out of doors, to shift gears, and to begin to think summary thoughts and even make summer plans, even though the COVID-19 pandemic has up up upended so many of our normal rhythms. Our love and prayers continue to go out to all who are suffering in these days here in central New Jersey and around the world. Now hear these words calling us to worship with one another. Across great distances, let us unite ourselves in the warm bonds of friendship and discipleship. Let us invite the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts, the one and same Spirit. And in that way, may we be united in heart, mind, and soul, no matter how distant we may be in body. Let us rejoice that through the Holy Spirit we can be together apart and let us worship God. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising.
Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, God, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now God glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy God, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Here ends the reading. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Our gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every one of our hearts be ever acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It happened some years ago that there was a gathering in London of bishops in the Church of England who came from around the world, the Global Anglican Communion. One of the topics for discussion was related to human sexuality, and in particular, the question of the so-called compatibility of homosexuality and Christianity. One of the bishops from Africa was so vehemently opposed to the idea that he spoke out very loudly and angrily against it, and for dramatic effect, he then marched right out of that convocation hall followed by his two wives. Culture, as we see, plays a strong role in whatever Christians believe to be compatible with our faith. For some, there is no question that people of every sexual identity are equally loved by God and Christ and are welcomed not only into membership, but also into leadership of Christian communities. And for some, there is no question that polygamy is an appropriate sexual relationship, including for those in high levels of religious leadership. Many of us have very strong beliefs, not just opinions, but beliefs on these and other questions of how to practice our faith. I believe very strongly in the fullest inclusion and leadership for Christians who are called to loving relationships that are not heteronormative. I also believe that polygamy of any kind, the having of multiple wives and the having of multiple husbands, dishonors and minimizes the humanity of the spouses who are replicated, and that such inequality in a relationship is not consistent with Christian ethics for marriage. I am most challenged these days by any insistence that there can be such a thing as Christian white nationalism. What a horrendous perversion of the gospel to insist that it supports nationalism of any kind, but especially one grounded in racial hatred. There are many subjects today about which Christians disagree very, very strongly. 
And this has always been true. In our reading today from John's Gospel, we hear Jesus praying to God that his followers will have unity because already divisions were in place. Jesus is praying out loud in front of his disciples. It's the biggest stage whisper ever meant to instruct them in how to proceed without him. So close is he at this time to arriving in Jerusalem and being put to death. In the decades afterwards, the biblical letters from the Apostle Paul and others testify to major divisions within local Christian communities. Should they eat meat that has been sacrificed in the market stalls to pagan gods? Should men be required to be circumcised in order to be baptized? Should they have a Jewish ritual of initiation in order to then have the Christian one? At weddings today, many couples select the biblical reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It is a beautiful statement about the qualities of human love for one another. But Paul wrote those verses not to loving couples in mind, but to a community that was coming apart at the very seams. He was imploring them to be patient and kind with each other not to be boastful and arrogant and rude. He had worked hard to ignite that community of believers in Corinth, and now it was exploding from the worst of human infighting behavior. He pleads with them to return to the gospel ethic of love whenever they feel the impulse to deliver a verbal thrashing and to leave the community. This is hard work. I don't want to dignify or to confer any legitimacy to the ideas of white Christian nationalists by even being in conversation with them. In all of the issues where we experience division, we are talking about competing ideas of justice, of well-being, and of responsibility to others. And we are also talking about the very content of the gospel, about the heart of what Christianity believes. Because that question is so important to us, we bring endless passion and commitment to the contest of ideas. It is not an insignificant thing, quite the opposite. We differ so greatly on questions of Christian love and justice, for instance, when we talk about an issue like abortion. Does the heart of the gospel reside in the bringing of every pregnancy to term? Is that what Christian love looks like? Does the heart of the gospel reside in honoring the particular religious and ethical beliefs of women and of couples regarding their own pregnancy? And is Christian love evinced in ensuring that every woman or couple can provide their child with healthy food, sound education, safe housing, and the other considerations related to why some people seek an abortion? How do we show love to women with unintended pregnancies? What does the gospel require us to do? Strong Christian beliefs prevail on every conceivable side of the issue. I've been speaking of social issues around which there is disagreement, but there are certainly equally divisive theological and doctrinal issues. All of us who are Christian believe in the Lordship of Jesus of Nazareth. He is the Messiah, in Greek, the Christ. Across the global spectrum of Jesus believers, however, we have serious differences in how we understand the nature of God, of the Holy Spirit, the relationship of the members of the Trinity, if we even believe in a Trinity. Some of us believe in purgatory. Some of us believe in hell and others simply don't. Some of us believe that God and the Holy Spirit are gendered beings. Some of us believe that Jesus of Nazareth transcends gender. Some of us believe that Jesus physically rose from the dead on Easter. And some of us do not, but believe that the resurrection was real and remains efficacious for all. 
Some believe that the resurrection opened heaven to all of God's children. Others believe the resurrection opened heaven only to Christians. And still others believe that the resurrection opened heaven only to Christians within their own sect. Some of us believe that the physical act of Holy Communion imparts the real presence of Christ to recipients. Others believe that communion is an act of holy remembering of our Redeemer. Some of us believe that no such external communion is needed or is valid, and that the communion we seek with God, Christ, and Spirit are only accessible on a spiritual level, unaided by physical practices. What do we still have in common? We have Jesus, and much as we argue over how to interpret his gospel, it remains our one touchstone. In his prayer that is our biblical passage for today, he instructs his soon-to-be independent disciples to understand God through the ministry of his own life. There are and always will be many ways to shape an argument and call it Christian. Jesus says to look at his own life and examples and teaching because they reveal God's love and God's work, God's plans for our redemption. We are to understand the nature of the God who is love by examining the ministry of Christ. There we see love always on display. We see mercy. We see compassion, especially for those whom society permits to suffer. We see responsibility for truth, for honesty, for the well-being of neighbors. We see endless commitment to a belief in the radical equality of human value. Human actions and words aren't always equal in value, but human beings always are. Human dignity is sacred. The natural world of which humans are a part is sacred. None of this should ever be violated. Where does this leave us? The question of abortion immediately returns us to the initial contest over what love requires where love is placed or sometimes emphasized. The gospel is no quick fix to many arguments, but it is our touchstone. Those of us in the United States are in the middle of an election year and the lack of unity among us is constantly on display. Christian citizens have a wide divergence of faith-based views on how to understand our political moment. A recent effort of Princeton's Office of Religious Life is called The Lection Project. You can find it on our website. Our idea has been to relate the lectionary cycle of biblical readings for worship to the election cycle and thereby highlight some approaches from Christian ethics to the issues of this national election. Healthcare, immigration, voter participation, and more. We continue to add issues and content to the website. For those of us who do seek unity, who seek understanding with one another, who seek the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that Lordship is the place in which we must begin. Jesus says to his disciples as he prays aloud to his God, that the extent to which each of us, his followers, really knows God can be measured by the extent to which our lives are or are not filled with works of love. To the extent that we demonstrate love, that we perform love, we will show that we understand who God is. While we sometimes differ mightily in how we understand what love requires, it is still the measuring stick of the content of our faith and of our ability to grasp the essence of who God is, who Christ himself is. Love is to be our default in every instance. 
The challenge of unity has always been great, but our shared starting point remains clear. Amen. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you for the beauties of spring, for rebirth and new life, for color and fragrance and warmth and sun. As we celebrate Memorial Day, we give thanks for all who have died in the service of the ideals upon which our society is founded. Open our hearts and minds to all persons who are different from ourselves. Give us ears to hear their stories and the curiosity of mind to want to know why they believe what they do. Teach us respect and gentleness in all our dealings with each other. Help us to persuade others by the power of the love that we demonstrate. Help us always to understand what the love of God and of Christ demand from us in every moment and every controversy. We pray for all who are ill, including Sohabe, Beth, Marge, Mary Ann, and Jackie. We pray for all who have died, including Donna Lawrence and the mother of Mary Ann Keys. We pray for the health and safety of all who treat the ill and the dying in these days, for all whose essential work puts them at risk of infection in stores, industries, doorsteps. We pray for all who work for vaccines and therapies. We pray for all who treat those whose mental health challenges are exacerbated by this crisis. We pray for the leaders of states and of nations that they will govern with the health and well-being of their people foremost in their minds. We pray for those who are lonely at home, for those who are overwhelmed at home, and for all of us who yearn for simple pleasures that once we took for granted. We give thanks for friends everywhere, for the technologies that keep us connected, for good work, for spiritual communities that, while unable to come together in person, persist with strength and power and uplift. We give thanks for every kindness that is shown to us and for the hope that you, our God, have placed within us. May we always draw from that holy hope whenever despair approaches or joyfulness departs. Each of these prayers and endless more, we lift up to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us continue in prayer, offering the prayer for Princeton. O eternal God, the source of life and light for all peoples, we pray you would endow this university with your grace and wisdom. Give inspiration and understanding to those who teach and to those who learn. Grant vision to its trustees and administrators, to all who work here and to all who bear her name. Give your guiding spirit of sacrificial courage and loving service. Amen. And now receive this benediction. Let us move forward through the days ahead, rejoicing in the Lordship of Jesus who teaches us the way of love and strengthens us to practice it. And the blessing of God Almighty, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, 
be with you this fine day and even forevermore. Amen. Thank you.